Hello and um, welcome to this uh, ses session two, um, which will actually explore the role and discuss the role um, of uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai um, cooperation or uh, competition. And uh, um, we have a technical problem, and uh, I think our presentation, Alicia uh, Garcia Herrero, was supposed to be the first uh, speaker. But we have a problem with the computer, so Alicia will be the last one. But um, so we will, at this point, we will uh, change the order of uh, uh, this panel, and I will start at the end of the panel and then walk our way uh, through it. Um, I think we have a, um, a very interesting panel because uh, it really combines the view of uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai, and uh, and I hope we will have a. Uh, um, the comments and the presentations of our speakers will generate an interesting and hopefully provocative debate and uh, questions from the floor. Um, well, I think I, I will really um, save a bit of time because we are uh, behind schedule uh, by not introducing properly uh, all our speakers. They are all very well known, and I think you have uh, their bios in uh, in your um, um, uh, pre in your uh, folders. Um, I will start actually, as I said, uh, by the last one on the list, and uh, uh, Nicholas Kwan, who's the head of research at Standard Chartered. Again, Nicholas is very well known in uh, in Hong Kong, and uh, um, before being as with Standard Chartered, was at the Monetary Authority and uh, Mary Lynch. So, Nicholas, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I just lose my advantage being the last to say. Yes. Um, I, I don't have a presentation, but I have a few, just a few points to make. Um, just recall some 25 years ago when I <clears throat> first moved to Singapore with Merrill Lynch. At that time, the question is how Hong Kong compared with Singapore in financial services. Um, being someone born in Hong Kong, but at that time based in Singapore, is very embarrassing because I say, if I say something good for Hong Kong, um, our, our Singapore guests, our friends may not like it. But if I say something too good for Singapore, I feel that I'm betraying Hong Kong. <laughs> so I try to get away from it. In fact, the lesson I learned over the last 20 some years is that <clears throat> competition is good. Without competition, we be all dead. Um, so it's good to hear someone to say that are uh, there competition between Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, and some, somebody else. But my take is that in several aspects, even if we want to have some competition between Hong Kong and, uh, and Shanghai, we may not get it in the near future. Just put Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai as a comparison. What Hong Kong and, Sing Shang, uh, and Singapore compare or compete is an area which both have the same kind of offering. But at areas which we don't have the same kind of offering, we don't compete. I'll give you an example. We compete in offshore business. Business which doesn't originate from ourselves. But we don't compete in onshore business. <clears throat> Hong Kong never compete with Singapore in Singapore dollar business. Same Singapore doesn't compete with Hong Kong on Hong Kong dollar business. So that's why I say that for Hong Kong and, and Shanghai, in quite a long time from here, we don't really compete that much. Because we are not going to compete with Shanghai on their onshore business. They are not going to compete with us on our onshore business. We offer offshore business with Shanghai for quite a while, may not offer them man, that many. Um, the time will come when this competition will get much tougher. When the RMB get more internationalized, competitivity get higher. I won't say full because we don't know how to define full competitivity. Then there will be some kind of competition, but that competition is still again different from what we have between Hong Kong and Singapore, because at that time, Hong Kong will be competing on an offshore RMB business versus 
Shanghai's onshore RMB offerings. Just like what we are competing with New York on US dollar business. I don't think too many of us will think that we will win New York in offering new uh, US dollar offshore business. But on the other hand, if you look at the example between London and New York, there's reasonable optimism. There could be segments where offshore business could be bigger than the onshore business. So my take is that in the near future, there may be more room for cooperation, collaboration, when China as well as Shanghai need to internationalize as well as offshoring their business. When it comes to some time, my guess is maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, the kind of convertibility as well as internationalization of RMB, as well as the China's own financial sector grow to that certain extent, we may be compete in head-on in several areas. At that time, our competitors will base on our true advantages, which could be tax, could be the system, could be tenant, could be other things. But one comfort I have, at least until 2047, when our basic law still lasts, is that there will be one country to system, and we base on our system on a common law basis, which is very different from the continental law basis in China and Shanghai. They give a lot of differences in terms of financial services. Some would say that the continental system may not work as well as the common law system. You look at the big financial center in London and New York compared with the others. My take is the last crisis teach us a lot, uh, uh, deep nation. Don't think any system has superior or permanent superiority over the others. Uh, at the end of the day, I agree with the uh, previous panel and especially the last speaker. We have to be careful what financial services are we promoting. It is something which needs to facilitate the growth and development of the economy, either just for China, Hong Kong, or broader uh, global economy. Um, one more uh, point I want to make is that there's some concern and risk. Not only that being in the financial se sector is a risk. At one point, I don't want to tell people I work for a bank. People will think that I'm a banker. I always say that I'm not a banker, I'm only a researcher. Um, financial service could be very risky, <clears throat> and we may not do a lot of good for the society. We have to bear that in mind. But for Hong Kong to compete in the long run and be sustainable is that we have to be open, and we, to have, we need to have a level playing field, not just for participants here, but participants from everywhere. There's a less low treatment advantage we have in our platform, which for quite some time may not exist elsewhere, including China. And that is here an advantage we have to preserve. I raise this point because recently there are concerns and voices saying that if foreigners create too much trouble for us, we should exclude them from our list. Uh, that is something we should not think about. We should never give up in offering a level playing field. Uh, I hope I <coughs> give a good start and start and leave it to uh, back to the <coughs> moderator. Thanks. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Juma. Uh, Juma is the chief economist of, uh, for Greater China, Deutsche Bank. Again, um, previous career at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and at the Development Research Center of the China State Council. We're looking forward to your comments on the competition and cooperation between Hong Kong and, Ch and China. Thank you very much. Uh, compared with Mr. Kwong, I mean, the even more awkward position to do that because uh, I'm a Shanghainese. I was born in Shanghai. I grew up there. And I'm still an adjunct professor at Fudan University. I talk to the Shanghai government a lot. Uh, but at the same time, I'm a resident here in Hong Kong, holding Hong Kong passport. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm involved in a lot of policy discussions with Hong Kong uh, regulators as well. So uh, I need to be really balanced. Um, now, what I want to do is really from the framework of RMB internationalization, 
uh, to discuss uh, what the role Hong Kong and Shanghai should play respectively. A lot of people have been saying that uh, Shanghai is going to be sort of the onshore market and Hong Kong will be the offshore market. I think that's too simple. A lot of things that uh, uh, both can sort of uh, <coughs> enter into the other guy's territory uh, in certain ways and in a healthy way to compete with each other. Um, now let me start with the big picture army centralization itself. I think uh, uh, the problem now we are facing is that uh, we have a broad objective but we don't have a specific goal. What do I mean by specific goal? Meaning that uh, <coughs> we need to achieve convertibility uh, within a certain period of time. Uh, nobody wants to say that because there are a lot of political risks, but as a researcher I would say that uh, China has economic foundation and has a need to achieve basic convertibility within five years. Uh, you may not need to stay that as a policy maker, but you need to, thinking about that. <coughs> need to be thinking about that and working towards that goal. Um, why do I say economic foundations are that? Number one, China's GDP, as I predicted many <coughs> times before, is going to be bigger than US GDP in 10 years' time. And number two, Chinese trade size, including imports and export, will be bigger than US total trade within five years. So economy-wise, the real economy-wise, will be ready to uh, internationalize the currency because the uh, foundation that support the RMB use for trade and investment purposes. And what's missing is convertibility. If you don't have convertibility, you don't, don't get there. If you do have convertibility, you can achieve or realize the potential that's going to be offered by the real economy. So we need to have a goal um, on convertibility. Now, what I do, what I say by convertibility is not a full convertibility. I think it's a basic convertibility in five years' time. Uh, my definition of basic convertibility is very similar to Taiwan. Um, you will allow individuals to convert up to five million US dollar, no question asked. Allow companies to convert up to 50 million US dollar, no question asked. Um, <clears throat> if we get there, I think we will have a lot of room uh, for RMB use for trade, investment, and for speculation purposes within the next five years. Hong Kong is going to grow massively in terms of offshore center, and Shanghai also has big room uh, for development. And uh, from the reform perspective, I also think uh, a goal, at least internal goal, is important. Why? Because if you know that you want to achieve basic convertibility in five years' time, you have to reform your internal system now. You put pressure on reform. Otherwise, a lot of reform are being delayed and delayed and delayed. It could be delayed for decades. Now, why do I say reform-wise? Uh, there are a lot of benefits. Let me give you a few examples. Number one, the uh, RMB exchange rate needs to reach an equilibrium level by the time your capital account is convertible. If you're still you know, a lot different from the equilibrium level in five years' time and your capital account is open, you'll be in trouble. Either you'll be inducing huge capital inflow, or as a central bank, you have to absorb <coughs> a lot of these uh, stabilization costs. Uh, so all of these are not sustainable. So <coughs> to uh, push the RMB exchange rate reform itself, we need a convertibility account, convertibility goal. The second thing is uh, the interest rate liberalization. This has been discussed for decades. I've been involved in that for the last decade, and I think uh, the process has been slow. But if you have a goal of convertibility in five years' time, which means that you have to liberalize the domestic interest rate system in five years' time. Otherwise, it's not compatible uh, with an open capital account. It will cause a lot of trouble. I won't explain too much in detail. It's very technical. So in that sense, we have reform benefit of having a goal on internationalization or uh, <coughs> on the uh, convertibility. Now let me come to the two specific issues of what Shanghai and uh, Hong Kong should do respectively in this process of moving towards uh, convertibility. Um, broadly, I think uh, uh, the roles, I think, will be defined according to my view uh, in, the, in the following two aspects. Number one, Shanghai will be servicing domestic clients. For example, there are a lot of Chinese companies who will be going abroad doing ODI. And uh, <coughs> their internationalization or the international use of uh, the RMB of their trade and investments should be done by domestic financial system, especially in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, Shanghai, I'm sorry, Hong Kong will be playing a role of basically servicing global investors or offshore investors. This is a role that we are playing already, but I think it will be uh, substantially expanded going forward. And uh, the second aspect of this division of labor is, uh, uh, although uh, well, Shanghai will be playing a dominant role in the onshore market, 
and in Hong Kong, we're playing a dominant role in the offshore market. Uh, but we're not sort of a black and white, sort of a, uh, talking about black and white division. There will be an offshore market that's involving lots of players, including Hong Kong, which will play a leading role in terms of setting price, uh, being the sort of financing center, and uh, or being the, the wholesale center in a sense, while the lots of uh, other offshore markets, including in Shanghai, Singapore, New York, and London, will probably be playing a role of retail markets in the offshore center, uh, or, or in, in the global offshore markets for RMB. Uh, that's how I see the division of labor uh, between Hong Kong and other parts of the offshore markets. Now, let me specifically say a few words on what Shanghai should do in the coming few years, or within five years, before we reach full compatibility uh, in enhancing its uh, 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 status as a, a China's financial center. Number one, I think QFI needs to be uh, opened much more aggressively than before. In other countries, when they introduce, initially introduce the QFI, uh, five or seven years later, typically, uh, they open the capital account. But China has done that already for seven years, right? And they were still far away from convertibility of uh, capital account. And by when the market can really open without sort of uh, inducing huge shocking flows to the domestic system. I think by the time when the QFI investments account for five, six percent of the domestic security markets, and right now in China it's only one percent. What it means that if you have a goal of five year <coughs> openness for capital account, you need to increase QFI participation in the domestic market by one percent point per year. Right? This year one percent, next year two percent, the following year three percent. What does it mean? For the amount of QFP that we need to grant, another 20 billion US dollar per year. And so far in the last seven years, we granted less than 20 billion US dollar. That's one major effort Shanghai needs to make. But it's not really the decision of Shanghai. Shanghai has had to lobby the central government very aggressively for opening the uh, domestic capital accounts, uh, domestic uh, security markets. And the second thing is the uh, interest rate valuation, as I mentioned. Um, it's really opening up the uh, financial system, especially the banking system, to non-interest rate uh, related businesses. And uh, that part of Shanghai has to lobby, at, again, very aggressively in the next five years. Um, it's part of the requirement for internationalization, but Shanghai has to take a leading role in that aspect. Uh, the number three thing I think Shanghai should do is to promote the uh, derivative markets. Um, and Shanghai has the natural sort of infrastructure and client base to do that. Uh, which will also be needed for a uh, internationalized currency after capital uh, accounts openness in five years' time. And finally, specifically, I want to say uh, Shanghai will have some route to play in the offshore market as well. I'm talking about Shanghai's offshore banking activities. I've been doing a survey recently in Shanghai, meeting a lot of banks. Uh, my sort of a preliminary conclusion is that uh, there are three reasons, real economy reasons, why Shanghai should also develop some offshore banking activities to serve three types of uh, real economies. Number one, the uh, uh, bonded <coughs> uh, zone, uh, the trading companies, import, export, and manufacturing companies in, in the bonded zones. Uh, they require a lot of uh, offshore banking services, and these services need to be provided locally in Shanghai. And secondly, it's the uh, Chinese companies going abroad. For example, large state-owned companies going out for ODI purposes. And they also need some offshore services and could be easily or more conveniently provided in Shanghai. And thirdly, the uh, uh, financial services related to shipping. It's a big business, and uh, Shanghai has lost a lot of that to overseas uh, financial uh, firms. And Shanghai has the capability of providing that services. So if we initially start offshore services for these real economy needs, we actually can limit the risk uh, to a very considerable level at the same time promoting the uh, uh, Shanghai uh, offshore activity without competing so much with Hong Kong. Now back to Hong Kong, which is my last point. Uh, the market has been growing very rapidly uh, in terms of the offshore market. Uh, all of you know the deposit number is now like 5, 000, uh, 5, 500 billion uh, RMB. And I think uh, according to my previous forecast, it will grow to 10, I'm sorry, 1 trillion by end of this year, 2 trillion by end of next year, and probably 4 trillion by 2014. Uh, that's how fast I think has been growing and will be growing uh, <clears throat> in the next few years. Um, there are a couple of bottlenecks I see clearly. Uh, 
that may limit the growth of offshore market in Hong Kong. Uh, I actually did a joint report with uh, um, Dong He yesterday. Um, I, I, will, I will sort of uh, very briefly mention a few points really in our report. Uh, if it's wrong, it's my responsibility. If it's right, it's our joint credit. <coughs> um, number one, the RMB trade settlement right now uh, is uh, almost like one-way trade settlement. Uh, it's mostly 90% for the uh, Chinese imports and uh, limited for Chinese exports. So I'll suggest that uh, why not opening up to all Chinese exporters for RMB trade settlement? Right? They increase the number in, uh, of the firms in the, in the pilot program a um, few times the last few years, but I think it's time, and we think it's time really to open up to all Chinese um, exporters for them to enjoy this uh, RMB settlement services. Secondly, RMB FDI. Uh, we know that central government has been discussing this RMB FDI scheme for a long time, starting from end of this year and until now, and policy has not been out yet. I think uh, to promote the asset creation in Hong Kong, we really need the RMB FDI policy to be out as soon as possible. Because once this policy is out, it's going to spur the demand for RMB lending, RMB bond issuance, and RMB IPOs. And therefore, we'll fundamentally address this problem of lack of RMB assets. And you know that lack of RMB assets will be a key bottleneck that's going to limit the future growth of offshore market here. The third thing is ODI policy, RMB ODI, which was out in the beginning of this year. Uh, I'm seeing a little bit of progress, for example, uh, CDB has been doing this uh, uh, fairly big project in, 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 in Venezuela. But uh, beyond that, I have not heard much uh, in terms of how RMB is being used for ODI purposes. I think we really need to promote uh, the, the, the growth of, of this uh, usage, RMB usage. And uh, one specific bottleneck I can see is that a lot of ODI projects by large state-owned company all need NDRC approval. Uh, very stringent approval process is applied. And in that sense, uh, I've been hearing from some state-owned companies that uh, if we get approval a few months later to do this project, okay. I, I don't know how to translate that. It's just uh, too much delay in the approval process. And finally, I think Hong Kong, at least over the medium term, need to promote what I call third party. Uh, usage of RMB. Uh, for example, <clears throat> um, some companies, foreign companies, have been issuing RMB bonds here in Hong Kong and they swap into third currency and using third country. And that kind of usage of RMB is what I call the best use of RMB without really interfering into the uh, Chinese domestic monetary operation. And it will create new assets in Hong Kong. And uh, taking the uh, euro dollar market example, one third of euro dollar markets use is actually for third party transaction. In that sense, Hong Kong has a lot of uh, room or scope for promoting this particular use of RMB offshore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now we have actually a voice from Shanghai. I hope it's not too, um, I hope you're not too conflicted like uh, uh, Nicholas and, and Jew between this uh, uh, alliance to and uh, uh, and loyalty to Hong Kong and Shanghai at the same time. I think uh, you, Gary, are uh, from Shanghai. Uh, Gary Liu is the deputy director of the uh, SIBS uh, Luju Zoe International Financial Center. And again, Gary um, is a prolific commentator um, and writes for uh, several publications, uh, including 21st Century Business Herald, China's Business News, Economic Observer, and so on. <coughs> Thank you, Paula. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, in Hong Kong today for this grand, this grand event. One benefit for being in Hong Kong is that you can see what you cannot see in Shanghai, in China. So I agree that freedom is the core component of Hong Kong as a financial center. Uh, nowadays, uh, the relationship between Shanghai and Hong Kong is very sexy. Uh, and it will continue to be so in the next decade. Because we know uh, the Chinese government has the 2020 plan for Shanghai. Uh, so this will be a very interesting topic today here. Uh, I would begin with a metaphor to describe the relationship between Hong Kong and Shanghai. I think China is a big family. Uh, Beijing, of course, is the father of this big family, and uh, this family has many sons. Uh, I would say that Shanghai is the 
eldest son, uh, eldest son of his family, and uh, Hong Kong is the younger brother. Uh, as the eldest son of his family, uh, Shanghai, of course, can have more resources from the family, you know, in the Chinese culture. But, uh, but uh, also, as the eldest son, you must have uh, more responsibilities for this uh, family. Hong Kong, as the younger brother, you have more freedom. You can do more innovations. Uh, but, uh, you know, in your role in this family is not so important as the, uh, as the eldest brother, uh, Shanghai. So this is just a metaphor. Uh, okay, I, I want to uh, start with Shanghai, then uh, talk about a little bit about Hong Kong. Uh, people have been, many people have been, you know, excited about the, the Shanghai 2020 plan. But for me, I'm not so optimistic. Uh, uh, I think uh, Shanghai still has a huge challenges, you know, to become an international financial center, uh, especially the, the following uh, several respects. The first is the big convertibility. Uh, we have we have been seeing that uh, the Chinese government is promoting ZMB as an international currency, uh, and the people has been discussing about the, the capital count convertibility uh, of ZMB uh, in the next few years. But we still we must remember that China has started to talk about ZMB convertibility many years ago since 1990s. Uh, we didn't see. Uh, too much progress in the capital account. Why is that? I think that this is highly risky for China's economy. Uh, first of all, we know that China's uh, real estate price, the stock, uh, the PE price to earning ratio is much higher than uh, Hong Kong and the U United States, which means there is an asset bubble in China. So if China opens its capital account, we can foresee you know, some capital flight. Nobody will buy, uh, you know, expensive houses in Shanghai. They will buy houses in California and in other places. Uh, this is a big risk for the, the Chinese economy. And uh, if the asset bubble burst, you know, this will create a big trouble for the banking system. And uh, that's why the, the central government's efforts try to cool down the real estate price uh, is not so effective because there is some concern over the financial risk. The second issue is uh, the green income. Uh, uh, according to some estimation that the green income uh, of China is uh, 5.4 billion, uh, sorry, 5.4 trillion ZMB. So about 20% of China's GDP. This is a huge amount of money. And this amount of money, uh, they don't have the sense of security or safety in China. Whenever they have opportunity, they will fly away. Uh, this will also cause some big problem if the capital account is fully open. Uh, so uh, given these concerns, uh, I don't think that uh, ZMB will become fully convertible uh, by 2020. Uh, uh, this is uh, my uh, first judgment. Uh, secondly, we, we know Shanghai's uh, legal system, Shanghai's regulation, especially the IPO uh, approval system, uh, is still very different from mature market. So this will be a big disadvantage for Shanghai uh, to become an international financial center. Because in the current system, we can see there are many insider treatings and also financial cheatings. Uh, recently, we know uh, many Chinese scandals, uh, Chinese, uh, many scandals of Chinese illicit company in the United States. But uh, we can see more and more similar scandals in China stock market, especially the China next market. Uh, what's more important for Shanghai and for ZMB convertibility, I think, is uh, the sustainability of the Chinese economy overall. Because if the, Chi if the Chinese economy cannot grow steadily for a long time, people will not have confidence in ZMB. So this will uh, create some uh, concern over the credibility of ZMB and Shanghai as a financial center. Uh, so far we have seen 
uh, the uh, sustainability of Chinese economy is a big question mark. Uh, for instance, we have seen uh, in, the, in the past several uh, weeks, we have seen uh, several severe, very serious uh, social unrest in Inner Mongolia, in Canton, in Jiangxi province, and Hubei province. Many people go on the street to protest the go local government officials. Uh, I think the, the, there are huge challenges in uh, pollution issue. Uh, pollution now accounts for about 10% of China's GDP, and also China's Gini coefficient is uh, 0.5, almost as high as that of the United States. And uh, all these issues, you know, uh, will pose a uh, huge uh, threat to the uh, sustainability of the Chinese economy. And uh, now we know there is some uh, political transition in the next uh, several years. Uh, for uh, during this period, according to past experience, I believe that uh, Shanghai's uh, 2020 plan is not a priority for the central government at all. Instead, the uh, political leaders of China they will focus on how to uh, manage the economic, trans uh, in economic transition of the Chinese economy and how to stabilize the political system. Uh, they, there is enough challenges for China before opening you know, the capital account. So my, uh, my brief uh, conclusion is that uh, the Chinese government will give priority to stability rather than market efficiency, which means that uh, the Zemin-Bi convertibility and the Shanghai Financial Center will take much longer time than people expect. This could be good news for Hong Kong. Uh, in this morning, we have, uh, we have listened to many uh, talks about the uh, Zemin-Bi interna internationalization. I believe that this can be a huge opportunity for Hong Kong, uh, for Hong Kong, because this is the best way for China to promote ZMB internationalization without uh, threatening, you know, the stability of the Chinese economy and uh, get everything controlled domestically. Uh, of course, uh, of course, Hong Kong must develop uh, this market quickly enough because. Uh, we know Shanghai and uh, Tianjin, they also have similar plans to develop their own offshore market. Uh, offshore market. Uh, you know, if Shanghai and Tianjin, they get support from the central governments, there will be more competition for this uh, new opportunity. Uh, for Hong Kong, I think Hong Kong should uh, quicken the process to develop a deep and liquid offshore market, uh, especially uh, you need to have more assets and uh, to attract uh, more uh, listed, com listed companies from China. Uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, Dr. Dong He and uh, Professor uh, Xi that uh, uh, Hong Kong is not doing uh, good enough in IPO uh, because uh, uh, for, for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, uh, as Professor Xi mentioned, that uh, large SOE in China, the most SOE already made the IPO, uh, and uh, the, the central government is trying to you know, decrease the number of SOE in China as a reform. Uh, the second reason is more important. I think um, for China's next few years, uh, high-tech companies, uh, growth companies, will be the major source of Chinese economy. Uh, and uh, we have seen uh, most uh, small and growth companies or high-tech companies, they have two places to make IPO. One is China Next, because simply because the price earning ratio is much higher than in Hong Kong. Of course, it has dropped a lot recently. And uh, for internet companies, e-commerce companies, they will always choose Nasdaq because many of them they are still losing money when making the IPO. So if Hong Kong uh, do not do enough job to attract this, uh, small growth and high-tech companies, 
especially internet and e-commerce companies, you will uh, give a big gift to China Next and uh, Nasdaq. Uh, this will be a big loss uh, for Hong Kong if you want to become uh, a financial center, especially by leveraging the China advantage in the, in the next decade, in the next decade. Uh, and also, I think, uh, you know, uh, Shanghai is uh, is building a, a huge Disneyland. Uh, this is not about finance, but still, I think this will become a negative news for Hong Kong. Uh, because most, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese consumers, uh, are, the number are huge enough and they are rich enough to spend money. And many people they, uh, before they came to Hong Kong for uh, shopping and also for Disney. But if Shanghai has a big Disneyland, you know, many people will not come to Hong Kong. Uh, and another thing is uh, Hainan Island. The uh, central government is giving you know, Hainan Island some, uh, uh, some uh, preferential policies you know, to uh, have duty-free shops in Hainan Island. This will also, you know, prevent people from coming to Hong Kong for shopping. So uh, I think Hong Kong should maintain, you know, its current position as a shopping center for the Chinese consumers. You should try to encourage the use of ZMB, not just the Hong Kong dollar in Hong Kong. Uh, every time the, for the domestic consumers, when they come to Hong Kong, they need to exchange ZMB to Hong Kong dollar which is very inconvenient. I think probably you can, in, in every stores and in taxi for uh, everything, you can encourage to use ZMB. Uh, this will be very uh, uh, good for the Chinese consumers. Uh, finally, I think, you know, uh, QDII and the QFI is also very important for Hong Kong. But unfortunately, uh, China's experiment with QD QDII was uh, blown away by the financial crisis, especially by the scandal with Lehman Brothers. Uh, I think uh, the Chinese government, the Chinese investors, they are very concerned. They want to diversify their financial portfolio, but they are very concerned with uh, financial risk. And especially, the financial derivatives now has a very bad reputation in mainland China. So probably for the next wave of uh, QDII, we need to, uh, we should encourage or focus on, uh, you know, uh, some blue chip stocks, some uh, low risk financial products, uh, and so that it can have uh, a big support from the central government. Uh, I think that, uh, in China, you know, there are enough demand, you know, to uh, invest outside China. The, the key uh, step is the central government, the central government must you know, try to give more freedom uh, to this. And Hong Kong should try to persuade the central government to use the Hong Kong market as, uh, uh, as a test bed. Uh, okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, I think the computer now works, we hope. So now, uh, last but not least, uh, Alicia uh, Garcia Herrero. Uh, I think Al Alicia needs very little presentation, especially here in Hong Kong. But anyway, she's the chief economist of, um, uh, for emerging markets at uh, uh, BBVA. And, uh, and she has a very impressive CV with uh, um, membership on the, and various advisory boards. Um, so it's all in our, in, in, uh, in the, uh, conference uh, pack, so I don't want to take more time from Alice's presentation, but I think now I'm starting to become a bit worried. I don't see anything on the screen yet. That's but fine. do you want to start? Sure, I will. Well, I'm actually quite relieved to be the last speaker, um, basically because I was worried to be seen as kind of a Latin gun with the Jesus, in the sense that I was worried about being too negative and being perceived as, you know, only Latins are negative and with the problems we have at home, I mean, not so much Mexico anymore, but 
I'm from Spain, so you know, I was like, well, this is not what I should be doing here. But then I heard Gary, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in good terms. You know, I should, I should be happy about being the last. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, banking. So it's going to be a little bit different than what we've heard, and the reason is that. I was involved in a project with Jesus, in fact, at Linan University, where I also teach, um, on Hong Kong as International Financial Center, and my part was on banking. So I do that, plus I work for a bank, and you know, in a way that is what I feel more comfortable with. Um, I'm not going to talk only about Shanghai and Hong Kong, I'm going to include Singapore. And the main reason is that I actually think that the competition is coming from Singapore more than Shanghai. I truly believe that Shanghai and Hong Kong will be more complementary than compet competitive. Uh, and Singapore is a different story, as, I, as I'll explain. One more reason to focus on banking, and I know this was not really the main theme of the conference. Let's not forget that Asia is about banking, as Europe is about banking. And frankly speaking, that's where the jobs are. If you compare hedge funds or you know, even asset management, that's not what's going to give Hong Kong enough high pay jobs in the future. It's about banking. So that's why I thought, let's talk about banking. So here we are. Um, again, I mean, Singapore is, kind of, if you thought about Singapore as a huge banking center, and sorry about, you know, uh, maybe standard chart and, not saying that this was not the case, but probably because you were there, it actually became uh, yeah, a big banking center. So, you know, if you think of many of the segments, I mean, they are doing better, frankly speaking. You, you think about forex derivatives, corporate banking, you think about uh, private banking. When I talk about private bank banking, I actually mean offshore, international private banking, not about Chinese, you know, uh, coming to Hong Kong. So it is a major uh, competition, I think, for Hong Kong. Uh, and Shanghai is, you know, is what I would think Tokyo has been for a long time. It's a huge country, it's a, it will have a huge financial center, but that doesn't mean that there won't be space for offshore banking centers such as Hong Kong. So what are Hong Kong advantages? One is a very simple one, very simple. It has so many institutions, much more than Singapore, for a long time. This is basically because Singapore started much later, yeah? But maybe also because Hong Kong is making it easier. Um, we had that experience at BBVA, by the way. I mean, it's much easier, in a way, to, to open a branch here and, and to make it simple for, so it may be different from the stock market story somehow. And that's what I hear from other, uh, other banks uh, in the city, which also operate in Singapore. So having a lot of institutions is already a very good thing, because it allows you to diversify. Now, I'll give uh, slightly worse news on diversification later, but at least the numbers show that it could be very good. Now, uh, I'm going to use a lot of boring statistics coming from the BIS, which are very hard to understand. I used to work for the BIS, and that might be the only reason why I can show these uh, statistics, because otherwise we just get confused about them. But to make uh, your life easy, I'm going to talk now about um, home operations. In other words, Hong Kong banks, what do they do abroad? How do they borrow or they lend abroad? These are the location statistics from the uh, BIS. So what you see there, and again, this is quite interesting, is that basically uh, Singapore is at Hong Kong's level in assets and liabilities abroad. The other interesting feature is that uh, Hong Kong has many more assets than liabilities. Mm -hmm. And you know, there may be a story there that I don't want to kind of explore uh, much further uh, due to uh, time constraints. Um, the other interesting thing, and this is easier probably for you to, to, to get a sense of, is that when you look at what they're doing with that money that they lend or borrow, Hong Kong is about banks. It's about banks lending to each other. Singapore is about corporates. Now, if I go back to the point of 
what should the financial system be doing for us not to be criticized massively by the public opinion? You know, I'm a little bit worried about this model of interbank, interbank, interbank that we see in Hong Kong. So that is another mm, takeaway for you. Um, and then Shanghai. Now I'm moving to different statistics. Shanghai is actually, this is China numbers. We don't have Shanghai numbers from BIS, but here I'm moving to what you receive. Yeah. So basically the bank finance flows that you get from the rest of the world, either through cross-border lending or subsidiaries. So you have it an incorporated bank, as you say here. Uh, look, you know, um, HSBC actually is still a subsidiary in Hong Kong as opposed to somebody else in Singapore. So that's what I compare. Um, this graph shows all together, yeah? Cross-border and subsidiaries operations in the three major centers I'm comparing. So first of all, you see something which is, I think, very amazing is that they all grow very fast. So. You know, at the end of the day, when we talk about competition, if, the, if you're all doing fine, you know, it's quite good. Still, if, you know, if you're not moving as fast as others, especially for Singapore and Hong Kong size, yeah, you don't want to explode. I mean, that, that is another takeaway I want to kind of bring across, is that, it, you know, this is growing too fast, too quickly, and that might be a way, something to think, okay, if, if Shanghai moves faster, that is actually not bad for Hong Kong because you might not be able to absorb more than what you're absorbing now. So huge growth in China, 6.6 .6 times in what, uh, 11 years. You, you might not want to do that. I mean, for China, that is okay. It's a huge country, it's a low base. For Hong Kong, that, that, that over 100% growth seems to me already big enough. So you are receiving a lot of cross-border money and subsidiaries, of, I mean, subsidiaries lending in Hong Kong, which is good. Um, now, how does it compare? It's interesting, Hong Kong is about subsidiaries. It's 60% subsidiaries as opposed to 40% cross-border lending. And this, from the research I've conducted, looking at the stability of, um, bank flows all over the world, well actually emerging markets, okay, those subsidiary lending tends to be more stable, yeah? So cross-border flows are more volatile for obvious reasons, yeah, and, and this is proven uh, econometrically. So I, I feel comfortable about Hong Kong's advantage with subsidiary lending rather than cross-border lending. However, and this is a slight negative point on diversification, it's mostly about UK banks. Nothing to, you know, <laughs> nothing to say about UK banks, but you, in a way you would like to diversify somehow. Yeah? You would like to have more, if you want to be a huge offshore center, you may want to have more subsidiaries, you know, incorporated banks from elsewhere in Hong Kong. Now it's becoming very dual, by the way, it's either UK or Chinese. And, and I think this, again, is a takeaway. I mean, you want to make it broader somehow. So Singapore is exactly the reverse. It's mostly it's more than 60% cross-border. Again, this is very much drawn by corporate, corporates asking for lending or even you know, going abroad, but mainly about that, and then fewer subsidiaries. And it's widely diversified across countries. So it's a very different picture. This is China data, not Shanghai data, as I mentioned. Of course, China is mainly about cross-border. If you think about the share of foreign banks in China, it's still like one point, I mean, it's really, really small. And because Chinese banks are growing so fast, it's become smaller rather than growing, uh, which is not really what uh, foreign banks were thinking about, you know, all, all these WTA uh, discussions, but that is what happened. And uh, we're there to see, you know, even my bank, like what are we going to do? This market is kind of somehow, somehow closed for us in a way. But um, what you see there again is uh, wide diversification across geographies. So there are a few takeaways, takeaways there for Hong Kong that I've already highlighted on, you know, more diversification. And I think a good thing is subsidiary type diversification. Um, 
So this again uh, shows the point I was making before that, uh, and this again is with uh, uh, host country statistics. That means Hong Kong as a recipient yeah, of cross-border bank flows or subsidiaries. You see the very same thing. It's about the banking sector even there. Yeah, it's, it's not about corporates. And the opposite uh, is for Singapore. Um, so the same message about probably, hopefully, more corporates, corporate lending in, in Hong Kong. The other thing, and this is very, like, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether I, I should dare take conclusions from these graphs, but I think I have, there may be a story behind, and, you know, we, we can have a discussion later, but this is about the currency of denomination of deposits, um, uh, sorry, loans in, and deposits in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Shanghai. And of course, there's, there's been a little bit of news on this uh, recently on you know the very fast growth of uh, remember deposits, which is okay. I mean, in, uh, at some point there, we were talking about substitution from Hong Kong dollar into remember. However, what the, what the statistics show is that there is more than that. Yeah, they are growing foreign currency uh, loans and uh, deposits are growing faster than local currency ones in Hong Kong, and this is not happening in Singapore. So, you know, for supervisory, you know, uh, issues, I think I, w I will stop here. But I think there is an issue about um, currency substitution. I've done a lot of work in my previous life on Latin American uh, banking crisis. I'm not arguing that this is similar, but, you know, the, the issue about currency substitution is a very difficult one, and you want to be very careful that that you control your money demand and in, in the different currencies. So I think this is you know, something to, to watch out. Of course, uh, this is Singapore, so you see much less growth on the, loan, on the lending side in foreign currency. And um, for uh, Shanghai, of course, this, this actually is worthless because of uh, in, uh, capital control. So you, you can't see much. If you look, this actually has to uh, different orders. They are the huge one is renminbi and the other one is local currency, uh, foreign currency. So it won't really, ha I won't have a point here. So Hong Kong, of course, has this special niche that we all know. About. I'm not going to spend a minute on this. On the renminbi settlement side, I mean, we're doing that. The pilot project for us is Peru, our bank in Peru. Peru is not going through Hong Kong. It's going through New York. So just to give you a little bit of sense of, you know, that. Hong Kong is not the only center for renminbi settlements. However, and that is not a problem because as Gary was saying, everybody is saying, this is a huge market. You don't want to be the only one. You don't want your foreign currency deposits to grow, you know, like balloon and then have a problem, uh, mismatch problem, or even if, of course, HKMA is very careful with that. But you don't want to force banks not to have a mismatch problem because eventually they will, even if it doesn't show. So I think that it's great, and you still have a niche on the bond market so far. And then, of course, HKMA, you know, swap line. Others may have one, but I'm sure you'll be better treated than anybody. So, you know, you still have a, head, a, a niche there, and I think that is more than enough. I wouldn't be worried about that. Um, on Shanghai, I wouldn't be worried either. Not only because Gary said, I mean, there's conflict in views here, but whether it takes 10 years, 20 years, it's, different. it's a different market. It's just a different market. I think there is room for everybody. If there isn't room for everybody here, where is the room elsewhere in the world? So, you know, I wouldn't be worried. I would be more worried if I were Frankfurt or, you know, somebody trying to get a niche in, in a place which is not growing. But I wouldn't be worried about Hong Kong. And you have the Pearl River Delta, and you have a lot of stories there that would make it. So, just a few conclusions. <laughs> I think Hong Kong, all in all, is in a great position, no doubt about it. It has already many banks operating here. I think that the challenge is to open it up a little bit more, make it more inclusive and diversify away by having more subsidiaries. Uh, sorry, you know, for those who already operate here, but I, I really think this is um, a fair uh, conclusion. Um, You'll, you'll get your way on renminbi internalization. I would not be actually keen on having it faster. I think it, it's better 
to keep uh, you know the even probably a slowing grow, uh, growing uh, path than what you've had so far for stability issues but bear in mind that complacency should really be avoided um, you know you have like kind of the old UK banks here which is great but you know other banks are appearing in the world. I'm not talking even about European banks. I'm talking about the Itaus in Brazil. You know, I'm talking about new huge players. And I think those are very important for you to be really uh, serving China for ch where China wants to go. Um, so not really enough happening in new segments, private banking, etc. cetera. Uh, much more is happening in Singapore, frankly speaking. Um, Shanghai not a problem, onshore versus offshore, we've mentioned. Um, so I think Hong Kong will have a relatively easy time to achieve what the conference is about. Uh, it has a lot of advantages, tax environment, secrecy, give the secrecy, it's very hard for us in Europe, but here it seems it's okay, so you know, so far so good. Um, more subsidiaries um, and focus, really focus, in my opinion, humble opinion, on diversification. That would be my message. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, we have 10 minutes now for the Q&A session. And as I said before, I hope there will be uh, many uh, provocative uh, questions. But I'd like to open the Q&A with... Uh, a general a comment and, uh, and perhaps a question to our panelists. Um, it seems to me then there is the issue here is actually time, the time frame, when things will happen, which is the time frame for the development of Shanghai as a financial center by 2020, as is in the policy, the policy goal, um, when the uh, RMB will become basic, basically convertible, uh, as uh, Juma said, or fully convertible. Um, but, you know, it, we know that time is relative, and I'd like to pick up um, a point that Alicia made at the end of her presentation, and uh, you say then uh, it's important to keep uh, a gradual and steady development, so uh, not to rush into this process. And I entirely agree with you, you know, stability is very important, and uh, we, it's very important for policymakers to keep uh, a foot on the brake to avoid any major disruption. But on the other hand, and I'm thinking of our session in uh, Taipei on Friday, I feel the frustration of business people and practitioners that they see all these fantastic opportunities in front of them and they would like to grab them now, not in five years, ten years, when it's too late, and or maybe you know, five years' time and or ten years' time, a long time, the long term, or maybe we will be, or we'll be dead, as, uh, as a famous economist used to say. So it's the opportunity is now, why cannot we grab it? So you come from the uh, business uh, uh, sector as well, isn't If you were very careful to qualify yourself as uh, researchers, analysts, rather than bankers. But how do you feel, how can you, is it possible to square this uh, legitimate and very important uh, need to keep an eye on stability, not to rush into this uh, um, uh, process of opening um, and creating the uh, uh, financial, financial sectors, and at the same time satisfy the urgency of business people. Nicholas, you have to. <laughs> I think there are two questions, actually, first on the speed of the convertibility and also the model. <clears throat> um, I agree with um, Jima that um, Taiwan model is a good model. When I heard about Taiwan model, then I've been very pleased that even the Chinese authorities take the same advice as from Jun, you're not going to see much competition in the uh, RMB business. <clears throat> uh, look at Taiwan now, what kind of competition we have in terms of offshore international financial services. But it's Taiwan is important in the sense that um, if you go through the last 20 years, many of the Asian countries have gone through the capital account convertibility, currency internationalization. Uh, they're good way of doing it, they're bad way of doing it. Almost everyone in East Asia ran into crisis during the Asian financial crisis. There's one clear exception, which is Taiwan. 
they did the opening very differently. They encourage outflow, discourage inflow. I think that is something probably China have to bear in mind. Um, back to your question is that other than the model we have followed, the timing is important. Um, I can't bet on five years, 10 years, 20 years, but planners, policymakers may have their own time frame for different reasons. Reality is the check for how, we, how fast you can do it. <clears throat> China theoretically have done current account convertibility 15 years ago, 1996. If you want to do a trade, not through an import export company, but by as an individual, you find how convertible it is. A lot of regulation is there, you can do it, but it doesn't mean that you can do it as you can do it as freely as you imagine. So there's a difference between convertibility versus practicality. There could still be checks of approval or even just normal banking procedures. I opened an RMB account onshore in China recently with some bank. Uh, I must say that it's not our bank uh, for different reasons. It took me only half an hour without me going to across the border. Being a Hong Kong resident, I have that privilege. Only to find out a month later that it's not just one account I've created or opened, it is four accounts I opened. One Hong Kong dollar account for remitting purposes, one Hong Kong dollar or foreign currency account for different investment purposes, one RMB account for remittance purposes or conversion purposes, and another RMB account for other purposes. And all of these four accounts are cut from each other. I have to go to the particular branch to do the transfer from one account to another before I can use my money. So practically, you can do that convertibility already, but you will find it hugely difficult. So what I'm saying is that to bet on how fast they are doing it is one thing. I can easily imagine within three, three months, four months, China can declare that they are Current uh, capital account fully convertible. You look at capital, capital account in four major items, FDI, bank flows, portfolio equity, portfolio debt, in and out, there are openings being created already. It's just a matter of practicality, how feasible it is. So my bet is that it's better to be slow than fast. But on the other hand, it doesn't mean that it's good for Hong Kong. From a Hong Kong perspective, I would like to see China move faster rather than slower. Because we are not competing with Shanghai on the onshore market. We're not even competing with them in the international RMB business. It's very different. We are not competing with, Thai, uh, with Tokyo on, our, on the end business, either onshore or offshore. We're not competing with New York. As long as they can convert and go out, we have business. So that's why I might take. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, let me add a few points here. Um, now, my views are from a perspective of independent economist. I'm not representing Deutsche Bank, uh, representing Hong Kong or Shanghai or any you know single body or, or entity or location. Uh, sometimes frustration I feel you know with lack of uh, progress in reform is really, I think, uh, the slower pace of reform. It's bad for the economy, for China. And uh, a lot of reform I mentioned here, for example, <clears throat> the uh, normalization of the exchange rate and uh, the uh, interest rate liberalization. Uh, these are things that they need to do faster for the benefit of a country. And uh, there are real economic needs for internationalization of currency. As I mentioned earlier, you know, ODI is now like 80 billion per year and will be going to 100 billion very quickly, Chinese trade, export, total exports are number one in the world, and uh, imports are number two in the world. All these, once internationalized, it's gonna create a huge market, and it will move the uh, system towards convertibility by itself. Uh, so in this sense, we're not really sort of speeding up the process to an unsustainable level. We're lagging behind. We're supposed to be faster before. We didn't do it. We're catching up with the real needs 
of the economy, and we're catching up with the real needs from a reform perspective. And let me come back to the two reform perspective, why the uh, disequilibrium exchange rate is bad, because it creates so much liquidity in the system, right? The central bank has to buy FX assets and accumulate a three trillion of reserves. How do you manage it? You know, what if there's a huge volatility in global exchange rate and you would lose lots and lots of money? So it's a huge danger in the system, which we need to address by eventually move to equilibrium exchange rate and opening up the capital account. And the other thing is that the lack of interest rate liberalization means the resources are allocated inefficiently to places, companies that they probably don't need, and they're not allocating to places and companies and individuals that they really need. So in that sense, the urgency is there. And uh, acceleration of the pace of liberalization is actually good for the economy. Uh, very briefly, uh, some comments. First, uh, I agree that China's uh, foreign exchange reserve is too much, and uh, I also agree that ZMB can appreciate a lot. But uh, we, sh we should remember that China has other alternatives, which is better than ZMB appreciation, uh, which is uh, to uh, raise the price for factors of production in China. For instance, the labor cost. The, uh, the pollution cost. Uh, if we, uh, uh, we let the uh, labor cost and the pollution cost rise to a reasonable level, China's trade surplus will uh, drop significantly. And we should also remember that in China, it is the politicians and not the experts who make the decision. Uh, for instance, for the maybe convertibility, Zhou Xiaochuan does not have has the say. It's the premier who make the decision, and uh, even you know the, the the nine member of the standing uh, committee. But uh, all these politicians, they know little about the finance. They make decisions by intuition. Uh, they have two important lessons in the past years. One is the Asian financial crisis. One is the recent uh, American, you know, subprime crisis. Both financial crises told them that uh, uh, it is good not to open the capital account. It protects China from you know, the financial storm uh, in, in other countries. Uh, if you tell them you know, the benefits of uh, opening the capital account, uh, blah, 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 but they are very cautious. They, they are politicians. They, may, they have different agenda for China's reform. And, uh, and also, I think, you know, uh, uh, of course, uh, China can uh, make, can did a lot of things to promote uh, ZMB internationalization, but it does not mean that ZMB, uh, China's expectation for ZMB is to be uh, comparable to the US dollar. Uh, because of the convert, uh, convertibility issue. Uh, but still, if China's economy is strong and uh, if the investor has some expectation for ZMB to appreciate, there will be demand for ZMB. Uh, China can make uh, significant progress of ZMB internationalization, but I don't expect that ZMB can, be, can replace the United States dollar someday. Uh, you know, in the next two or one or two decades, it's uh, very difficult. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, not much time, but the floor now is open. There are two microphones here, and I think we have a, an, in, an intervention, if you don't mind to uh, go. Oh, you have a microphone here, actually. And can you please uh, uh, tell us who you are? And uh... Yeah. Well, uh, I, I hope the uh, uh, Paul Xu, I'm the president of uh, Apple Foundation. Okay. Now here in Hong Kong, I feel uh, a very special feeling because I, a couple of years ago, I asked uh, originally a Hong Kong-born person, Barry Lam, I don't know whether he's Hong Kong-born, but he's from Hong Kong, uh, now chairman of, of uh, Kwanta, uh, to uh, become the, 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 the uh, current chairman of Apple Foundation. And uh, he was a Hong Kong student, went to Taiwan, and he created Quanta, which is one of the largest supplier of notebook computer, okay? Now, from this notion, I'd like to say, the three places, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Taipei, this question is falling into the category of paradigm question, as uh, Paula, you suggested. Supposedly, okay, uh, 
We want to promote startup company into small, medium-sized company and then into bigger company. Okay? Now, this phenomenon has existed in Taiwan. But suppose uh, in China, because okay, so my experience in China is there's a lot of entrepreneurs, but they are not getting help from the state on back. So if we line up a value chain of financing, okay, starting from angel fund on the equity side, and uh, then a venture capital fund, then elevator to mezzanine, and then IPO, and uh, on the debt side, then we will have a small loan, uh, and then leasing, operation lease, uh, financial lease, and then uh, into guarantee company, you know, help to guarantee them to get the bank loan. So with this uh, chain of equity and chain of debt financing, now, uh, out of the three places, how do we work together for the purpose of promoting the small medium sized industry in China? And uh, I mentioned this because in the 12th five year plan, it was particularly mentioned to promote small medium sized industry. I think the central government recognized that. When I look at that, my feeling is deja vu. Uh, the Chinese official asked me, why you have this uh, deja vu uh, feeling? I said, this is what Taiwan did, okay, helping small, medium-sized company grow into bigger company. Okay. So I want to bring this issue, I think in the future, uh, it's very important to have a, a new company with innovation emerging. And then from now, we had to help them to, to start. Okay? And financing is a very important aspect. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think I, um, I get another couple of questions. I think we have one there, so for the sake of uh, time. Uh, Carol, you're from Phoenix TV. I have a more basic question for Dr. Ma Jun, actually. Um, why does RMB need an offshore center at all? Just because the laws are better and more transparent in Hong Kong? Um, the underlying premise of the RMB is that um, the investors trust the currency and hence the credit worthiness of the government. So once the RMB is internationalized, uh, why can't everything be done onshore? Thank you. Okay, if there is no other questions, um, as Perhaps we can address this, uh, firstly, this question, and then maybe the panel can uh, uh, address Paul Hsu's question. Right. Let me tell you the example of the uh, US dollar offshore market. That's a euro dollar market. On that market, a lot of people raise money. And 70% uh, of the fundraising are done by non-residents, meaning non-US citizens. They like to use the offshore market rather than the onshore market in the US. And also in terms of deposits, those non-U.S. residents, 90% of them, want to keep their deposits, U.S. dollar deposits, in the offshore market rather than in the U.S. Why? <clears throat> because they're afraid that some of the money will be confiscated in time of you know, political <clears throat> crisis or wars or something like that. Right? There's the origin of that from Russia, from Middle East back 20, 30, 40 years ago. And the same sort of a perception concern exists uh, for Hong Kong as offshore center. A lot of people um, you know, non-Chinese residents, even some of the wealthy Chinese residents, they want to keep money here. And they want to buy RMB assets in Hong Kong uh, for fear of policy change and, you know, other things. Uh, that's a permanent reason for the existence of offshore market. And uh, uh, even if uh, the short-term reason like RMB appreciation disappear five years later, I think Hong Kong offshore market will continue to exist. Thank you. Um, now, we are really at the limit of our time. So may I come back to the panel, maybe starting with you, Alicia, and maybe try to focus on this yeah. uh, question of financing SMAs sure. and how the centers can actually cooperate in this issue, yeah. and maybe we can wrap up the panel. Yeah. Well, um, I think to really tackle that issue, the best thing is for China to liberalize interest rates, frankly speaking. I think there is a question about competition. Uh, it's just too easy, you know. You have um, there the deposit rate that basically 
won't allow you to offer a higher rate to those who really are willing to, to get that. And on the lending side, if you look at the surveys, you know, it's, they're all at the bottom. There is not enough competition. If there were, you could accept companies with a higher risk profile because that would be your niche. In order to have that niche, you really need to support newcomers in the banking system. I know I'm a, you know, work for a foreign bank, this might look like propaganda, but frankly, this is how others have done it. And they might not be the winners at the end of the day, you know? Like in Spain, foreign banks never did very well, but they brought competition into the system so that others would, you know, start lending to SMEs or more mortgage lending or consumer finance, blah, blah, blah. So that would be my answer. Now, on the pace, going back to that question in one minute, I was actually referring to Hong Kong, not to China. In other words, the, the problem is if China is too slow, Hong Kong will get too much. That was my point. And by getting too much and accepting that much, that is where the risk may lie. Okay. Uh, two comments. First, I think China must uh, uh, promote ZMB uh, interest rate liberalization, as uh, uh, Dream mentioned. Uh, it is very important because uh, because of uh, the uh, they may be interest is not liberal uh, liberal we see that in the in the recent you know uh, microeconomic uh, you know control uh, uh, many small and medium sized companies they cannot you know get bank loans and they have to go and go on the banking which is very risky and uh, the, the cost is very high. Uh, I think that there is no uh, reason for China to continue this uh, stupid policy. Uh, uh, in the past years, we see uh, interest rate control is for the sake of big banks because the interest uh, rate spread is very high, three, uh, three uh, percentage. This is trying to uh, help the large banks to accumulate the profits to increase their capital. But now they are they are so profitable and they uh, they are kept to you know adequacy is uh, very good, uh, so there is no need to continue this uh, policy, and because of interest rate control, you know, uh, the real interest in, in China is uh, actually negative, which is also unfair. Uh, the second comment is uh, of course China should allow more uh, competition. Uh, especially from uh, uh, foreign financial institutions, including you know, uh, no, you know, non banks like uh, uh, you know, guarantee companies, uh, small loan companies. This kind of uh, uh, financial uh, service provider can be complementary to uh, China's banking system. I think on the SME, there's no simple answer. The, what is needed for the SME in Taiwan versus Hong Kong versus mainland China or even coastal versus inland is very different. Um, for China's case, I think reform of the financial sector, not just interest rate reform or liberalization, is key. Uh, but there are many others because um, um, property rights is another one. A lot of other industry policies which penalize the SMEs launch the sector could do more damages from the lack of finances. Um, the second issue about, uh, I think there's the last question from the media is about uh, why China want to internationalize, internationalize the currency is very critical. Um, Jim, my answer from a market perspective, I think that's ultimately could be the case. But what we saw over the last few years is more driven by the policymakers. What, they, what do they want? which may be different from the markets. Because I can't imagine the Chinese policymakers try to create or internationalize the currency so that someone who are holding offshore RMB will feel more secure. Uh, because it takes quite a while to convince people that holding RMB is better than holding elsewhere, uh, other currency, particularly US dollar. Uh, the key aim for the policymakers, as I interpret it, is they want to make RMB an international reserve currency. That is a direct response from the financial crisis we have gone through. So much of the world's problem comes from the domination of US dollar in the global monetary system, including China, which holds so much foreign currency reserve, is also in trouble because if US dollar is so dominant and it's not 
trustworthy, credible, you could be in trouble. And because of this dominant pe uh, position, it allows, doesn't necessarily mean that they will, but it allows that issue of this global currency to be less prudent. Some people should suspect that China want to be less prudent also because there's a synergy. If you want, if you, once you are issuing a global currency, you can borrow without necessarily paying back. You just print money. I doubt that is the purpose because Chinese have too much savings this time. But to balance out and also make China's life easier, if RMB is one of the reserve currency, not necessarily a major or most major, uh, most important one, but one of the many, first, China doesn't need to hold too many of the foreign for, uh, reserve currency of other currencies. Just like Euro, uh, in 1999, once the Euro develops or starts, many of the European Central Bank have, can sell down their own reserve. So I guess that is something we have to bear in mind. But my take is that I don't advise as well as imagine China make the RMB to, to become as dominant as US dollar. Either it's difficult, may not be beneficial at all. Um, being an international currency have a price to pay. Uh, if you look at the uh, <coughs> experience of Britain, if you talk to BOE now, the chances that they say they don't want to internationalize your currency. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as, as I said this morning, uh, talking about uh, financial centers in the region inevitably leads to talk about other big issues. So we started with Shanghai and Hong Kong. Uh, we moved to Singapore and we finished with the dollar as the uh, reserve currency. Um, it was a very, very fruitful and rich discussion worth uh, spending some extra minutes here. I'm sorry we're a bit uh, late, but it was a very enjoyable session. So. Please join me to thank the participants and also to thank the uh, Bauhinia Foundation for this uh, very well-organized and successful uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you.